Welcome to the Finlings Podcast, a death-defying podcast where we analyze all that goes into effective filmmaking. I'm Jonathan. And I'm Alex. And this is episode 131, Channeling Jackie Chan. Wow. Uh, that's more Bruce Lee, honestly, but that's part of the story. So There's a crossover. Uh, there, there is a crossover. There's actually a very direct connection. It's kind of interesting uh, to see the... the Comparison between the two, uh, both deeply connected to Hong Kong. But anyway, today we are talking about Jackie Chan, uh, the one and only Jackie Chan who's appeared in literally over a hundred movies. Uh, that's actually incredible. That's insane. That's a that's a that's a very large number, even for people who worked in like the silent era yeah. of of Hollywood production. That's like TV um, show statistics. And he's basically been a performer since he was six. Uh, he. <laughs> Get much say in the matter. He got packaged off to a school when he was a kid and he's been performing ever since. And he just kind of has this natural charisma and his comedic timing in uh, in combination with his just physical prowess uh, makes him maybe one of the definitely one of the best actors and maybe the best physical actor of all time. Hard uh, to be like kind of like Charlie Chaplin. But if Charlie Chaplin could also beat you up. Yeah, I like actually had the form and technique of martial arts and not just pratfalls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not to say that Chaplin wasn't an incredible athlete, because he was. Right. But Jackie Chan was a better athlete, is, is a better athlete, um, by far. I mean, the dude's a master of, like, ten different martial arts styles, as well as acrobatics and different forms of tumbling. And he's literally spent almost every day of his life married to his job, studying and developing uh stunt techniques and he spawned like this whole uh wide industry wide country spanning family of people with the jackie chan stunt team as well that kind of continue in that tradition and bring out some of those better qualities in different areas and we're going to get into all that uh but first we have to talk about the man himself um and before i get into what is essentially just the cliff notes version of his life uh i do have to recommend his autobiography which i listened to on audible a while back it is really not sponsored good. by Audible, but hey, we're open. I mean, we would go with that. Audible, <laughs> please. Um, but I do recommend his autobiography. It's really cool. He actually takes a very humble uh, approach to his own life, which is really interesting. It's nice to see the parts of his life where he gets giddy, where like he's still really giddy about and proud of like when he was a still like basically just a stunt man and a director was really he- fond of the way he played dead on screen. He was so proud of that. The man who's been uh, who's like a worldwide legend. One of the things he's most proud of is like this compliment he got when he was younger. Um, What's the uh, name of that autobiography? Oh, that's a good question, Jonathan. Uh, we'll put a link to it in the doobly doo. Uh, it's called Never Grow Up. Oh, that sounds appropriate. It is perfect. He is kind of like a. Um, he de- it definitely has that kiddish joy about him in everything he does. But anyway, we are talking about Jackie Chan, and this might not surprise you, but that's not his uh, birth name or his real name. In fact, his birth name is Chong Kang Song, and his real name is Fang Shilong. Uh, it's not uncommon for people in the East to have multiple names, especially if they're famous. Um, famous people tend to have different epigraphs, different names. A lot of these ha- have something to do with becoming the dragon or eternal dragon. In fact, his name in Japan is Seru, which is a mythical blue dragon. Um, and a lot of that actually has to do with the branding uh, in his early star career where he was closely connected to Bruce Lee who was also branded as the young dragon on screen. Um, But he was born in Hong Kong in 1967 to refugees of the Chinese Civil War. And as a baby, his nickname was Pow Pow, uh, which is the noise a cannon makes. So a rough translation (laughs) would be cannonball. Um, So he was just already tumbling and knocking into everything. There were stories he tells in his autobiography where he's just falling over trees, climbing out of his backyard as a kid. Um, Sounds a lot like Buster Keaton when we would talked about him. Very similar. Uh, but as a as a small child, he was sent to the China Drama Academy in Peking, um, where he learned martial arts and acrobatics in a very strict environment. Uh, but he became very close with his uh, fellow uh, young athletes, including one Sammo Hung and one Yuan Biao, who would appear in a lot of the movies together, known as the Three Dragons. Um, 
And as a kid, he was part of this performance group called the Seven Little Fortunes, who are often loaned out to movie studios to uh, do various background work and stunt work as kids. So he, uh, since like the age of eight, uh, when he was an extra in Big and Little Wong Tin Bar from 1962, he's been in movies, uh, which is how you get to be in 100 movies, by the way. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but his his father, when he was really young, moved to Australia for work. And later on, as a young adult, he would go to Australia for a, a short period of time to attend college at Dickinson College. Um, and he also worked in construction during that period of time where uh, he was under taken under the wing of a man named Jack, who kind of acted as his mentor and his big brother in the construction company. Um, and he eventually became known as Little Jack and then eventually as Jackie. So it became pretty common for um, uh, in English speaking uh, places, Britain, Australia, North America, that he would become known as Jackie Chan. And that is his name to this day when it comes to stage and a lot of celebrity circles. Um, as he grew up, he continued to work in film as an extra and eventually a stuntman. Uh, where he impressed a lot of people, even working in a pair of King Who masterpieces, Come Drink With Me and A Touch of Zen. I think we've done both of those on the podcast. Uh, uh, no, we did Touch, of, Touch of Zen and Dragon Inn. Yeah. Uh, Come Drink With Me is also amazing. Uh, he was eventually signed by producers in Hong Kong who saw, thought he had a lot of potential, but they started branding him as a Bruce Lee clone, which was super duper common. Uh, I think I literally have a shirt from uh, from Alamo Draft House, which has an old advertisement for this one guy who is advertised who is named Lee Bruce instead of Bruce Lee. <laughs> like there were anything you can imagine, any twist on the name that existed after Bruce Lee passed away and Hong Kong was trying to fill that superstar void that they had for a brief moment. Um, but he didn't really that wasn't really working because. Bruce Lee kind of has this brooding, almost like James Dean uh, my, or uh, Marlon Brando-esque quality to his acting. There's a lot of brooding and intensity in what he does. Jackie Chan is not that. Jackie Chan can do drama, but he's more of a fun comedy. Uh, he's kind of got like this. Yeah, he's got this almost like Monkey King, if you're familiar with that character. He's like the trickster. Um in, in his in his act, that's kind of the archetype that fits him better. Uh, and when someone actually let him design his own stunts in a movie called Snake in the Eagle Shadow uh, in 1978, that's when he really hit it big and he began to shine. That's when the basically the genre of comedy kung fu and kind of the genre of just action comedy in general became a thing. Um, which is something that we love to this day. If you think about like Edgar Wright movies, that they're all action comedies. Yeah, Edgar Wright is very influenced by Jackie Chan. Oh, very much so. Uh, I mean, Super Cop comes up in Hot Fuzz, I believe. Uh, yeah, it does. After a small role in Cannonball Run in North America, Jackie Chan would uh, periodically have these attempts to break into the American uh, audience in the uh, market in the 80s, and they wouldn't really pan out until the 90s. Uh, but he he appeared in Cannonball Run, which is a um, Burt Reynolds. It's a Burt Reynolds movie. Um, but he appeared in that one. Very small role. Wasn't taken very seriously in that role. The movie definitely didn't treat him very seriously in that role. Um, but he did like that the movie ended with a series of outtakes from the movie uh, that ran with the credits. And he's kept that in his movies basically ever since. Anything that he's had a, uh, a say in. Um, in 1983, he established the Jackie Chan stunt team, which is that team that kind of works on all those stunts. They workshop everything. They do a lot of iteration and in-depth research to kind of make every stunt scene burst and come alive and be really fun and feel planted in the world that it comes in. Um, and that still exists to this day. Uh, I don't know how active a part of it of he, he is anymore because he's, he's getting up there in years, but he is still like the progenitor of all of that. Uh, he's called big brother by everyone in the organization. <laughs> um, and throughout the eighties is when Jan Chan really kind of started to experience that amazing level of success, mostly in the Chinese market with series like police story, uh, project a meals on wheels, 
uh, and stuff like that. So uh, as far as I know, like I think there were several action films in America when Jackie Chan was was in Hollywood for a bit that had failed and hadn't really made him the persona that he wanted. And so when he goes back to China during this point, he uh, he basically he wrote and directed Police Story, as we're going to talk about. Um, and that was kind of like his Rocky, like he was trying to prove himself to the film world. And I think you can really tell that there is like a level of intensity and connection to the work that Jackie Chan has. And it really like that character from Police Story that we're going to talk about, Kakwe, becomes like his persona from then on almost. Oh, very much so. Very much that trickster, a little bit brash, a little bit arrogant, like, like but very lovable at the same who's time. Like got the skills. Yeah, 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 yeah. He has the skills to back it up, and yet still somehow he over always overreaches and screws up regardless. Which, let's be honest, if if uh, most people had the skills, they would still do the same thing. Um, but he would uh, continue to break into the rest of the Asian markets and eventually Europe throughout the late 80s. But it wasn't until 1995's Rumble in the Bronx that he hit box office success in North America uh, which followed with a re-release of Police Story 3, which came out before Rumble in the Bronx, as Super Cop, and eventually uh, brought him to the Rush Hour series, um, which uh, we're not talking about directly today, but it is on the expanded list. Um, this led to a series of high-budget action comedies on this side of the 20th, uh, 21st century, uh, including Shanghai Noon, The Tuxedo, around the world in 80 days and you can debate whether or not those are really good movies but uh undeniably in each one jackie chan brings his all to the table that's what he always does uh, and you'll find amazing amazing action se sequences in all of those films um, even if the overall hollywood production is a bit um <laughs> shovely to say the least uh, and in the past day, a decade and a half or so, as Jackie Chan has started to get a bit older, um, there's been a bit sh of a shift in his style. He started doing a, a bit more voice acting like Kung, Kung Fu Panda and a bit more dramatic work with less of an emphasis on action like The Foreigner, uh, which still does still have some action, but not nearly as much as like Police Story, where Jackie Chan is basically putting his body through hell for entertainment. Yeah. Um, his 100th film came out in 2011 and it was called uh, 1911 uh, which is kind of funny but it was about a uh, war that took place in China in 1911 uh, Jackie Chan is a formerly trained and extremely successful Chinese music artist as well which I feel like is just weird to talk about because it's just so unexpected I know. But he, he is he's released like 20 albums in China and they're all incredibly popular, and he's super famous for it. He um, he also sings a lot of the theme songs for his movies when that theme song is in uh, Chinese, which is just crazy. Yeah. Um, and if anyone's wondering, there will still be more Jackie Chan movies. His next movie is called Project Extraction, uh, where he's co-starring with John Cena, and it's coming out sometime this year, or it's supposed to at least. We'll see what if it actually does. All right, so yeah, with that, let's talk about what we are talking about to, uh, today, and that is The Drunken Master from 1978, directed by Wu Ping Yun. Uh, it's peak kung fu comedy, uh, a lot of fun. And then Police Story from 1985, directed by Jackie Chan, uh, the only one this week, um, but there are several others that were directed by Jackie Chan. Um, this is Jackie Chan's intro to action comedy, um, more modern action. And then we're going to skip <laughs> skip down to Police Story 3 because the marketing on Super Cop is really confusing. Uh, so Police Story 3 or Super Cop from 1992, directed by Stanley Tong, uh, which is the last Police Story movie to also star Michelle Yeoh as uh, Jackie Chan's girlfriend, uh, May. Oh, and she's not she's not the girlfriend. She's the other action star. Oh, she's the other one. Okay. Well, it yeah. is the last one to, to star the girlfriend character. Finally, we will be talking about The Foreigner from 2017, directed by Martin Campbell, based on the book The Chinaman, a 1992 novel by Stephen Leather. Um, apparently, in the book and the movie, even though the book is called The Chinaman, uh, the character is Vietnamese. 
Um, they should tell you about everything you know about <laughs> that you need to know about the quality of the uh, the writing we're getting in the book and the movie. Yeah. The the attention to detail. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna get into all of that. Uh, and really, the yeah, we're gonna talk about <laughs> the foreigner at the end. It's gonna be a little different than the rest of the than the rest of the podcast. It's it's kind of a Jackie Chan movie. Um, it's more of a Jackie Chan movie. In it. He's on the cover. Does that He's count? In it. He's in it. It kind of it kind of tells us a lot about what's going on currently in Jackie Chan's career and where he's uh, what what he's doing at the moment and where his focus might be. Um, but we will talk about that. It tells more us a lot about the it. current state of action movies too. It tells us a lot about <laughs> the current state of movie making and how streaming might have ruined everything. But uh, we're not here to talk about that right now. So let's go on to the individual breakdowns. Jason, take it away with Drunken Master from 1978. Drunken Master from 1978. Wang Fei Hung has had a bad day. The assistant teacher at his father's martial arts school is overbearing. The young woman he hits on turns out to be his cousin, and her older guardian who beats him up is his aunt. And finally, he beats up a hooligan who turns out to be the son of a very wealthy and influential man. Now his father is punishing him by making him train with the drunken master beggar So. But So has a reputation of crippling his students, so Wang Fei Hung runs off only to run into deadly assassin Yim Tit Sum, who has been hired to murder his father. The only way to beat the assassin is to learn the way of the eight drunken immortals. It's up to Wang Fei Hung to quit being a bum and get down to training. I feel like Drunken Master is like the Chinese equivalent of uh, Captain Jack Sparrow. In a lot of ways, yeah. It's kind of like <laughs> the same. It's, it's a trickster model character, right? Yeah. Um, oh, wait, literally do you want to get into drunk. it? Are we getting, yeah, are we getting into it. it? Yeah, let's just go for it. Just go for it. All right, we're into it. We're, we're, in it. we're, we're talking about movies today. Oh, my gosh. Um, so yeah, so this one, like we were just saying, does it, this is where, uh, Jackie Chan's like trickster persona really starts to shine where he's really starting to be in charge of his own, uh, his own stunts and kind of adding this whole level of comedy to the action that happens in his movies. Um, which also allows the, uh, the, the action to be a little more continual, uh, yeah. compared to a Bruce Lee movie, which is fun. And also just really impressive because this guy's going for like the entirety of the movie, almost constantly rolling around and getting beat up. Um, and this is also that kind of, it's not the end, but it's kind of the tail end of like that peak of the mid century, mid 19th century, 20th century, uh, Wuxia era, um, yeah. from films like King who through Bruce Lee through Jackie Chan, um, I think there's, yeah, there still would be more Wuxia films, but they 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 change significantly after this. Yeah, we've talked about several Wuxia movies, and there you kind of have to make a distinction between Wuxia films and Kung Fu films, which is more what this is. Because yeah, there's no there's no uh, there's no, no fantasy. In this. Yeah, there's no fantasy element of like you know literally chanting uh, the chi or um, chanting the chi. <laughs> chan- channeling the chi and I mean, being Jackie able to Chan fly does chan and his chi. kind of stuff okay yes he does <laughs> chan the chi um but a little backstory on this this movie um is that this is kind of one of a long history of movies kind of centering around a character called wong fei hung uh and that is jackie chan's character in this kind of a, a younger version but wong fei hung was a real a uh, guy who was a martial arts master and uh, started like a school of martial arts. And then his legacy just carried on after him and started being like, even back into, I think the silent films in China was a character that was really taken on. And, but oftentimes they were, they were a lot more um, kind of serious, I think. And so drunken master was Jackie Chan, um, kind of taking on the role and giving it new life as as a younger, more kind of foolish character. And we really basically see the whole hero's journey within the the film. Um, but it's interesting because I th- I'm trying to think of the closest comparison I can make. And I, I guess it would be like Wong Fei Hung is kind of like Robin Hood. He's kind of like maybe he was a real person, but now he's just mostly a legend and like all these stories yeah. kind of build yeah. on that character. Uh, yeah, there's so probably not that like they're all a continuous. route somewhere yeah. in reality, but like it's the the 
all discerning of it is totally lost. Like it's yeah. become mostly legend now at this point. I totally understand. I like I like how much this movie is just about showing off what Jackie Chan can do. Like there's the portion of the film where we go through the eight drunken masters for the first time. Uh-huh. And each one is like a minute long clip of Jackie Chan just doing different Kung Fu moves. And that's all it is. Like it could be a YouTube video like, of someone doing Kung Fu so in a field, you did, but you it's did martial so arts, fun. And I did, I did some martial arts and it's like doing your belt test where you just mm-hmm. have to go through a list of moves. You have You're to not do fighting all anybody. Your moves, all You're your just forms. hitting all the points. Yeah. Yep. 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 You're just showing off what you can do. And, uh, yeah, they're all they're all hilarious, of course, because each each time each clip is not just Jackie Chan doing um, the the uh, the performance of a martial artist as uh, someone who has physical prowess. But each one also has like an entertainment quality to it, too. There's a story. Like his, yeah. His mistress. Ho is <laughs> super hilarious. Flirtatious, is hilarious. Um, just dancing around, batting his eyes at everyone and all of his other uh performances are just really cool really interesting and unique um one of the running gags in the movie is him cut because he's basically the trickster figure um and he gets he actually i've noticed this in a lot of his movies he gets called um a monkey or little monkey a lot uh which makes sense for his acting style and how he's always getting around um but also in chinese mythology the monkey king was a big is like one of, if not the big trickster figure, almost like a Loki, um, where pretty mischievous, maybe good, maybe bad, but definitely going to trick you. Um, And the fact that he's constantly trying to get out of work, that running gag in this movie where he's constantly uh, trying to get out of training is just so funny, especially because other Kung Fu movies are all about people just doing this ridiculous training all the time and taking it super seriously. And here Jackie Chan is just trying to get out of the training and in the process of getting out of the training, doing things far more impressive than the training itself and far more funny, um, which is the wonderful, wonderful gag line. Yeah. And then you come to the point where he gets actually defeated by the kick master, whatever his name was. (laughs) And then he he has to he literally has to crawl back naked to the master and be like, please teach me so I can win. Um, but the, the, yeah, the, the progression of the film is so like linear. I mean, there's, it just kind of moves from point to point, but every point ends with him fighting someone else. And the, a lot of the excitement too comes from the kind of cartoonish characters. Like everyone he fights has a thing like the, even his, um, the stick guy, there's the Don't stick guy, the stick. head, the head guy, the guy with the <laughs> mole at the beginning. Like everyone has something that just makes them like a straight out of a cartoon. Um, but they're all so fun to watch because then it's like every fight has a different slant to it, a different spin on it. Um, so it's almost like every fight it is gives it a lot more flavor. Yeah, yeah. It gives it gives it a lot more flavor, it makes it a lot more interesting um, than just two dudes fighting, uh, which can be fun. Uh, but whenever somebody has a thing in a fight, you know, that makes it cool. It's a character in a fight, which is always interesting. Um, did you watch this as the dub or did you watch this with subtitles? I just watched the um, subtitled version. OK, OK. I think the, the only dub, one I watched dubbed was Super Cup. The dub was amazing. <laughs> so Jackie Chan actually has we talked about how he got into voice acting in the past decade or so, but he actually is pretty pretty uh on point and pretty um focused on making sure that he does his own dub in english i wasn't actually sure at what point in his career he or if he learned english in school or not i i don't know well i mean he worked in um he was in school in australia for uh four years as a young adult so i'm guessing sometime around then at the latest okay um also as he grew up um it was there I don't know for sure. I'm just spitballing here. I mean, Hong Kong was still uh, British controlled for most of his life. So you see that a lot in police story. Yeah, uh, it makes a big way into police story. So and, and his parents worked as um, servants for an English family at a certain point. So oh, that makes it's sense. not it's it's not out of the woods that he would just have some English knowledge just growing yeah, up yeah, in yeah. Hong Kong in the 60s. 
Um, so probably probably a little bit of, of natural pickup plus like some study in in Australia and it's it makes a lot of sense. But he's gone back to um, even to when he didn't have as much control over his career and as many of the old movies that are still in circulation as he could find, he's gone back and done the dub on them. So his dubs, the dub from Jackie Chan is always really good. Like his character is always really well done. And then a bunch of other characters are like, it's just a, it's just a shotgun of maybe they're good, maybe they're bad. <laughs> uh, but there's this amazing line uh, in the dub where he's confronting the stick guy for a second time. And uh, someone comes up to the stick guy. He's like, hey, is everything OK? And the stick guy goes, yes, but go get my stick. Uh, and it is just it. I, I laugh my butt off every time I hear it. It's so good. Uh, there's also a good part earlier in the film where Jackie Chan does his his uh, snake pose and goes, "Ooh, I got style um, in a way that only <laughs> Jackie can Jackie Chan could say it. And. The, the delivery of that line just embodies everything that Jackie Chan is about. Like the over-the-top cockiness that also comes with a bunch of skill and a weird mix. You know he's going to get himself in trouble and screw some stuff up, but also get himself out of it in a really interesting way by the skin of his teeth. It's such a good setup for a character. Um, like he's cocky without being annoying. Um, he's, uh, he's, he's skilled without being like overly heroic or overly competent in a boring way uh it's just such a good mix of like bumbling and skill that just clicks like yeah. he and he does this for character after character in this really cool way you see it in a uh, police story too um uh, not police story too although it isn't police story too i mean police story as well um and in super cop you see a slight fall off with that style of character in the uh, movies that come with uh uh, American production it, it's not as good but the early Jackie Chan where he's like in, more in charge of his productions especially in Hong Kong is really good yeah yeah all right Jonathan what do you think about the way this movie ends with the showdown no the end of the showdown it just ends with the uh, the finishing of the showdown there's no resolution oh, after yeah. that that's just wins. I mean that that feels kind of traditional too. Like I I think of a lot of movies, you know, Rocky does that. Uh, even Karate Kid does that. There, so it, well, even, it's not my favorite way Rocky, to end, but it's not out of nowhere. So so even Rocky has uh, the point where he's shouting for Adrian after the battle. Uh, yeah, that's true. There there is there is Rockies that end with a punch, but uh, the original Rocky ends with a, a short resolution on top of it. I think it works in this case. Uh, one, to be perfectly frank, it is a basically a B movie, and it's yeah, got the yeah, it's like got said, the running time of one. Uh, uh -huh. and it, it's just uh, maybe B movie isn't the right context because it's not being produced out of Hollywood, but it is a genre based film, and it knows how long it needs to be, and it's about an hour and a half long and no longer. Uh, they're like we're not fighting anymore so we're not going to bother you with any more which is fair which is fair and they also did a good job of throughout the movie wrapping all of uh, our character growth that we see through Jackie Chan's character uh, into his fighting abilities yeah. and into his commitment to fighting and finding his own way to fight that is his own way because obviously he was never going to be, be a success within the rigid structure of his father's school he needed someone more loosey goosey, like his grand uncle, uh, to teach him how to do it, and then how to find how to because he always wanted to be his own person. He needed someone to come along and teach him how to find a way to be his own person, um, because no one can really teach him what that his own person is going to be, what his own fighting style is going to end up being. They can only mm -hmm. kind of show him how to find it, and that's what happens over the course of the movie. And that moment where he wins the fight not only ends the plot of the movie, but ends the character story of the movie too, because that's the moment where he really has fully come into his own as a fighter and therefore as a young man. Uh, Except it does teach you the importance of doing your homework because he comes to that last master, the the woman character, and he's like, I didn't practice this one. Oh yeah. So he yeah, almost yeah. can't do the fatality or whatever. What a, what a, what a perfect, what a perfect moment. Like, Oh yeah, nope. I, uh, I, I was a bum still. Then he Hit just makes butt. it up. 
Um, I will Perfect. say though that the the beggar so character is so much fun and it's such a great contrast. Like, I mean, the old, the old, uh, like you said, Lucy Goosey master versus the young hothead is like a classic pairing. But beggar so is just great. I mean, they over exaggerate everything with his red nose and everything. But that first fight the, in the, the makeup in this movie is kind of got like this stage like Kabuki feel to it. Yeah, it's a little one of those movies overdone. that was not planned to be on Blu-ray. Um, Oh, of course not. <laughs> this, the, you you were meant to see this movie in like a cigarette smoke filled, yeah. crowded co- Hong Kong movie house in 1978 or 19. Yeah, 1978. You were not meant to see it in the comfort of your living room in 4K res on a Blu-ray disc. Yeah. Um, but that first fight in the bar is is great. And with Jackie vers- and the the beggar character, which is the classic reveal of he's just sitting there drinking in the corner until the fight breaks out and then he dominates the whole thing. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, there's, there's all these, all these little elements that are like cartoonish, but also building on classic uh, literature and storytelling and stuff like that. Just, just makes like a super fun story. That's like you said, no longer than it needs to be. It's such a good watch. It's such an easy watch too. like, if you really, it, it's true entertainment in every sense of the word. Jackie yeah, Chan's very good. It really good is at that. nonstop. It's it's very rare that I feel like a Jackie Chan movie drags. Um, yeah. But uh, with that, I think that we should move on to Police Story from 1985. Jason, take it away. Police Story from 1985. Inspector Kakui is part of a sting operation to arrest crime lord Chu Tao. It goes horribly wrong, and most of a shanty town outside of Hong Kong is destroyed in the ensuing chaos. Despite this, Kak Kui catches the criminal and is turned into the model policeman of the police department's ad campaign in turn. Kak Kui is then given the job of guarding Chu Tao's secretary, Selina, who is uncooperative at first. The two soon find themselves chased by assassins, and it's up to Kak Kui to ensure that the man he caught doesn't dispose of the evidence. I, one, one of the things I love about this movie, besides everything else I love about this movie, is uh, the kind of like almost Miami Vice feel the whole thing has, if that makes sense. Okay. Like it definitely feels like it takes place in the 80s. It takes, I mean, yeah. there's even a big oh, action there's scene a in a very mall. 80s music. There's like crime lords and drugs and vehicle based like shenanigans. Uh, it's just in Hong Kong and not in a Florida swamp. Yeah. Yeah, no, I got that too. Um, and even uh, a little bit later, but like it almost had lethal weapon vibes towards the end when he starts to oh, for basically sure. have a mental breakdown like this. This was it is action comedy, but it's also holds a really firm grasp on the action side of things. And, yeah, uh, you know, it fits well. It has moments like uh, this movie is very much like I said, like lethal weapon, like police drama and i think police story two which will kind of just roll into this whole discussion since we're going to talk about police story three anyway police story two has a almost more of like a born like espionage kind of a spin to it um and but they have like a level of grit that some of those older like comedy movies don't have um and there are still plenty of the uh slapsticky moments especially with may uh, and we'll kind of talk about May later because she never learns her lesson. Um, yeah, how does she not? How have they not really hammered this out after three like three movies, movies in a row? They have the exact same conversation. <laughs> I work <laughs> undercover. I work undercover. <laughs> you might see me with other people. Don't talk to me. Uh, but of course, it wouldn't be funny if she got the point. So yeah, yeah. But but this film does does a really good job of of having both of those things in it, and you know when it's doing the. Jackie Chan has trouble convincing his girlfriend that he's not, you know, hanging out with this other woman, but he's on the job uh, and he's like yanks her off of her scooter and all this stuff. And then it turns around and all of a sudden later in the movie, he's got to hold his boss hostage in order to get away and get to the bad guys out like outside of his uh, jurisdiction. Like it, it does both of those things really, really well. And it's, it goes a little far on both sides, but not so much that you can't hold it all together. Certainly, yes. Um, it never, even though people are definitely become kind of cartoonish in uh, in Jackie Chan movies, they never stop being people. 
like there definitely is a, like that fundamental understanding of being a human and human emotions and kind of like this grounded drama underlying at all the comedy, which kind of makes the comedy work even better. Uh, Cause when you go completely cartoonish, sometimes it can be hard to have that baseline that keeps you grounded and reminds you why things are funny in the first place. Uh, but this one definitely hits it. And this one's firing on all cylinders. All of the scenes are all in on designing uh, these stunts and just like these incredible blocking movements to make, uh, to just show off Jackie Chan in every possible way they can. Like even the physicality in scenes like uh, one of my favorites is the one where he's answering all the phones in the police station because yeah. he's the only one in there. And there's not really any huge stunts. There's some cool stuff with like flipping the pencils and moving around uh, and the physicality in that small stuff um, and the blocking and the the scene design is just so impressive and fun and active. I, I never thought it, someone talking on the phone for um, for such a long time could be so interesting, but it's hilarious. Uh, it's one of the best scenes in the whole movie in a, in a movie full of amazing scenes. Yeah, so that's really the cool. question is, can you pull that scene off with cell phones? Cell phones ruined another great gag. Oh, you could do it with a bunch <laughs> of different cell phones, maybe you, if you they're all over could. the place. Yeah. Uh, but people wince more when you drop a cell phone than when you drop a corded phone. And that, uh, so the uh, the scene in the mall, I feel like we need to talk about that because Jackie Chan right. is famous for his stunts. This is the He's end famous. of the movie, but it is like, like this is the movie, this is the scene that Jackie Chan wants you to remember about the movie. Oh, for sure. And the thing, the, there's a big chase in the mall. There's a bunch of cool stunts built into it already. But there's this one part where Jackie Chan is at the top of the mall and he needs to get to the bottom. And he does that by swinging on this uh, rope that it ha- is covered in light bulbs and sliding down it. And all the bulbs burst along the way as he drops to the yeah, floor. Yeah, I think he grabs a pole and his feet go through a bunch of... Either way, yeah, a bunch of light bulbs are it, shattering all around him. Grabs a pole, smashes through some glass. Um... Uh, but man, apparently he, he got, fainted twice while doing that stunt. He got messed up <laughs> doing this stunt. Just absolutely destroyed. Like he mad. He, he got beat up to hell. Although the most impressive thing to me about this stunt is that as soon as he lands, he is on his feet and full throttle barreling into one of the bad guy extras. And like he is not taking the time to rub his butt or his clean his wounds. He's just going after it so that the shot can get yeah. enough enough of the shot for the editor that they don't have to fake it. Um, yeah. And speaking and this, of, this they shot really it cool. like 10 times and they show oh. you every not 10 times from 10 different angles and they show you all of them. Oh, yeah. 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 And and obviously it's really cool that he's physically capable of doing this, that they were able to pull this off cinematically. Um, and then he has the, the, uh, he, he's not one to back off and use a stunt man. Um, he does it. That's his thing. He is the physical guy. He will do his own stunts and he kind of braves that way for everyone else, uh, in his Jackie Chan stunt team to also be confident doing it. He would never ask them to do anything he wouldn't do. Yeah. Um, in that sense, he's a really good boss. But the scary thing is how psychotically devoted <laughs> devoted to entertainment oh my gosh. Jackie Chan is to do this stunt in this way, um, especially because they just kind of did it. There wasn't like a lot of safety precautions. <laughs> well, there's, there's not much else you can do. Like you can put him on wires, but he's still crashing through all those light bulbs and going to exactly. hit the ground. <laughs> exactly. And what I'm what I'm trying to to get at is the fact that this is a scenario where you can do that kind of scene. Before, regardless of whether whether or not you think performers should be doing that scene, it was done. And it's really cool. Um, but you could never, even in 1985, even if 1960. Um, you would never, never, ever, ever do a scene like this in Hollywood. Yeah. Not a chance in hell. And if you did, it would be faked in some kind of large way so that people wouldn't be put at risk. Um, not, and again, I'm not saying that's better or worse. I'm just saying it's a unique situation to shooting in Hong Kong at the time that he did as Jackie Chan. And there still are instances of movies more recently within the past 10 years or so that kind of had the same thing. Uh, if you've ever seen The Raid, um, which is an amazing movie jam-packed with all these crazy action sequences and stunts. 
but it was done by like a British team that wanted to do it. But people in Britain were like, no, 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 no. This is way too dangerous. You can't do it. So they went over to Indonesia and did it there in a place that didn't have as strict of rules or was more willing to do it, Um, which is an interesting angle to it. And obviously this one came off great because it's Jackie Chan and he's incredible. But also he almost killed himself doing the stunt multiple times. So, you know, I, I respect someone who's willing to die for their art but I'm never going to ask anyone to die for their art. So it's, <laughs> right. it's a weird situation to be in. I'm very glad he survived and he continued to make movies, but it is, is one of those moments where I feel a little conflicted watching it. I enjoy it. And then I'm like, Oh wait, he almost died doing that. Yeah. Ooh. Oh, this is Jackie Chan directing. Let's talk about that. This is Jackie Chan directing. He's in charge um, of the whole thing. I mean, he writing. Always, he, this is, this is his Rocky. <laughs> I mean, he basically always d- writes and directs his own stunts scenes. So that's why even in like Shanghai Noon or The Spy Next Door or The Tuxedo, even though the rest of the story might be complete and under gibberish, the scenes where Jackie Chan is fighting are super cool and yeah. super well done and the best part of the movie. And I think a big reason for why those movies are as successful as they were at the time Even if they were panned critically, they brought in a lot of money to the box office because people want to go see Jackie Chan do his thing. But this is what happens when you let Jackie Chan be in charge of the whole thing and you see just how much of a master performer and a master storyteller he really is. He is so good at this. I mean, he's basically been doing it since the age of six, right? When he was sent to the school. This he and he lives and breathes it. Like this is what he does. Um day in and day out and he is dang good at it too yeah and again it's it's bringing in these other elements that weren't part of the persona that hollywood or the greater uh chinese or hong kong film industry were trying to put on him like he's he's now in the reins he's saying this is the kind of character that i want to play the kakwe character who is tough but also has the the soft fumbly side too um, and he's getting to put in like his own levels of action and comedy um, and stuff like that. So he's got, you know, him hanging off of a bus as it's driving down the highway from an umbrella that he's doing. The umbrella is just kind of inherently comical, even though it's still like an action scene. Uh, and so, again, he's mixing all those elements together in like his own secret potion formula. Uh, but I just I really like the way that police story one and two specifically are shot, especially for some of the dramatic scenes like there. There's an element of noir to these movies like police story oh, two yeah. when he's been captured and uh, the bad guys are kind of hilariously reading May's breakup letter to him for like the third time. But still, he's he's like chained up there and she's tied up there and there's like no lighting in this warehouse and then they start throwing firecrackers at them like it's intense um and and there's there's just this element of really good uh like you said really good storytelling that's going along with all of these other elements that jackie's bringing to the table oh yeah 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 yeah. and i mean it kind of makes sense right it is basically a noir setup in a lot of ways it's um a cop a detective, an inspector, I think. Can't remember his it specific title. I uh, not that it really matters. But he's in charge <laughs> no, of essentially he's not an inspector. Go- the other guy was Inspector Man, but in the subtitles I kept reading Inspector Man. Like a superhero. <laughs> Inspector Man. Um But what was I gonna say? Oh, it's a noir setup, right? It's a it's a it, it's an investigator of some kind who finds himself wrapped up in this criminal organization and he has to guard an unwilling femme fatale from this person. And, but also it's an action comedy at the same time. And this one, which is where his girlfriend comes in. If it was true noir, he, there would be no one between him and the femme fatale and he would be very tempted. I also like how much he plays into being his character whenever he does his action scenes. Like, Kakui at no point magically knows Kung Fu. He's always fighting in this desperate kind of bumbling cop manner and just manages to get away with it uh, by the skin of his teeth. You know, we know 
that Jackie Chan is it knows all these forms and stuff, but he's not using them in this movie because it's not. Yeah, uh, it he's not. Fit he's not totally movie. inexperienced. He when he's fighting, he's he's fighting pretty well. He's usually disadvantaged, but he's still fighting well. Yeah, I'm 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 trying to say that he doesn't. He's not using like the forms you would see in like a kung fu right, uh, right, right. historic semi historical movie like we saw in Drunken Master. I think yeah, it's like his form he's, is, he's switched is up dirtier. his style. It's more modern to be a more like a street fighter kind of yeah, yeah, police yeah. how how a, a policeman would fight, you know? Yeah. Um which is makes a lot of sense. And you know he put a lot of thought of of how this character would fight into it and also kind of merging that with how he as a person is capable of fighting and stuff. So there's there's a lot of levels of acting and design that went into every part of it that makes it so good. Yeah. And I think not as much sugar glass as there should have been. Oh my gosh, I was going to add that was my question. I'm willing How, I'm willing to bet a lot of that was real budget? glass. <laughs> I'm willing to bet a lot of that was real glass. Oh my yeah, cuz sugar glass shatters differently and some of that shattered like glass. A lot um, of it just looked like glass. Um I'm also not 100% certain that they didn't just go destroy a, a shanty town. At the start of this movie, which I don't know how he didn't mention that. <laughs> oh my that. gosh, that was the most incredible thing. I've never seen something what, as what insane as that. That was yeah. like the first five minutes and they are driving cars through these shanties that are built all the way they, up a hill and just destroy. They like, out Fast and Furious, any Fast and Furious movie. Oh yeah, it second. came out of nowhere. Mostly because, it's, mostly because this is completely real and uh, Fast and Furious is just a bunch of CGI. I oh, also there's forgot that there's, there's, there's a potty joke within it. the first five minutes before that when one <laughs> one of the cops like wets himself because he's so terrified of trying to shoot at the bad guys. I forgot about that oh, whole scene yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah, it gets yeah, so yeah. overshadowed by the rest of the movie. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. And uh, Jackie Chan's character um, kind of like tries to encourage him and he ends up shooting a guy. That's yeah. right. OK, again, Bef- that, that whole section really felt Miami Vice. Yeah. Me. Um, before we go to Police Story Three, I want to talk about two two parts from Police Story Two, um, and one is the bomb strapped to the chest, and the, the other one is is the finale. But the the finale the entire scene of the bomb being strapped to Jackie Chan's chest, and he has to go do the pickup for the bad guys who are getting their extortion money, and he's got like 10 minutes and he's trying to tell he's going through all his people and he's got to tell them, don't stop me. Don't stop me. And then he comes out and he has to go under the tunnel and he has to rewire the bomb with wires from his car, which I'm sure doesn't work like that, but I've still never seen something like that. Uh, and like, Oh my gosh, there's just so much tension in that one scene. There's a lot of tension in police story too. And then at the end they blew up an entire, uh, like factory, like for real, with Jackie Chan in the shot. I would believe it. And it's dangerous to really be that close to explosions. <laughs> Incredibly dangerous. Yeah, no, that is never done for real. That is always some kind of fake thing. Uh, because you don't know what's gonna happen. And granted, it's a huge wide shot, and Jackie Chan is very small in there. But he made sure that he was in that shot while that place was exploding. Yeah, no, that's wild. The the danger this man puts himself through. The fact that Jackie Chan and lot is alive is incredible. It's yeah. just I don't understand how how that that's still he going got on. through that's his. Wild. And Police Story Three is no easier. Like Police Story Three has a kind of a a lighter lead up, but it pays itself off. So shall we get into it? Yeah, let's get into Police Story Three. Police Story Three, Super Cop from nineteen ninety two. Kak Kui is the resident super cop of the Hong Kong police force and is sent to Guangzhou to aid the Interpol director, Jessica Yang, in tracking down the drug lord known as Chai Bot. Kak Kui infiltrates the organization by breaking Chai Bot's henchman, Panther, out of prison. Yang soon joins as his sister, and the two are brought along on a series of vice-based escapades around China and Hong Kong. Okay, honestly, to me, Police Story 3 feels much more like lower lowbrow comedy than like gritty noir like police story one and two like there's a That's there's fair. a definite tone shift it feels it feels a little uh more of a, it feels even more of a genre film yeah i should i should put it that way 
Uh, there is much a, a, a much more driving plot in a lot of ways. It definitely feels like our character is really getting dragged around in this one. There's a lot of shooting in thing. it, too. It's just, this one has bullet hell action scenes, which, if you, were, if you were to ask me, do I want to see Jackie Chan jumping around a very unique setting, or do I want to see a bunch of bullets? Uh, Jackie Chan jumping around things. Bullets wear themselves out real fast. It's like, oh, look, yeah. more bullets. Oh, they look, kind more of bullets. Especially because you know it's all... F- pretty soon. Especially because you know with Jack... And this isn't as big of a problem in other movies, perhaps. But in a, in a movie with Jackie Chan, really doing his stunts practically, I don't want to spend my time looking at a bunch of effects. Even when yeah. they're practical effects. I'm like, I could be seeing the real thing right now, and I'm not. And that's not to say there isn't amazing stunt work in here, both by Jackie Chan and Michelle Yao, who is an Indonesian actress who recently got really popular um, in modern movies off of some roles she did. Um, which oh, is she a, was in Crouching Tiger. Yeah. Um, she was, yeah, she also a big wuxia artist. Um, also very skilled and does a lot of really cool stunts in here too. Um, a lot of really incredible fight scenes and the the kind of like tension between their two characters as they're both trying to basically bumble around is really fun to watch. Um but but yes, they they're, they kind of up the ante in the number of performers and the size and scale of the plot in a lot of ways, especially because it kind of has like this Interpol angle to it and multiple cities they visit. Yeah, and but I the, will say too, the, this is the first one not directed by Jackie Chan. That makes a lot of sense. The uh, and not that this one is bad. I I, I don't want to I don't want to put that impression out there. Um, it's just kind I of really different because like well. I feel like one and two hold together stylistically really it well feel like and it this has one feels that different unique signature to it it feels yeah. like it could be any action comedy um it, and it, it's still good I, I, but it's just it's not it could have been so much better if jackie chan had been in charge just just yeah. saying yeah um and and there is the may story so this this is the one where the may story oh, there got, is another may story the may story takes over like the whole nerves. third act it's it ta- crazy. It takes so long. She spends forever at this on this pool scene. They do have so little so another much time in the pool, pool scene. Yeah, I, I'm going to stand by my Chekhov's pool forever until someone doesn't fall in the pool. Um, but she's like, she's yelling at him. He's trying to be undercover. The other woman, uh, the other uh, Maggie. Oh gosh, Michelle Yeoh's character is also there. They're both like kind of being held hostage, but also kind of working undercover. Uh, and May is there on a field trip, like at, like literally just there to make conflict. And she just starts yelling at him. And then the bad guy like calls her a hooker, basically. And so she gets really upset. And it just goes on for so long. And we've like it would be different if we hadn't already seen this exact same conflict two other times in the first two movies. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Uh, it did feel, I don't know, man. It was, it it was so weird just because we had already resolved it a couple times. Yeah. It wasn't like less funny. And I guess because it was re- re-released in the way that it was, there's a good chance that a lot of people that saw this movie as their first movie that introduced them into the police story franchise. That's I think feasible that's that this was their first time experiencing it. But I, I think don't this think was this more movie was designed for, for that release. It was definitely designed for a more international release and just the yeah. inclusion of Michelle Yao in that um, in that loop kind of makes a lot more sense. Um, it w- would explain a lot of that, right? Like a more of an international cast, um, yeah. more of an international audience. So I could see that for sure. Uh, oh my gosh. This, scene, <laughs> this movie has the... The cross dressing. They have the inspector. <laughs> Do you remember the the inspector when when he's first going undercover and his inspector, who's been like a dramatic part of the first two films, has to play his mother in <laughs> as oh, part yeah, of his yeah, cover. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it gets weird. <laughs> he's playing this old lady, and then as soon as they leave, like he's got these these cushions that fall out from under under his shirt and stuff. So that's like, that was pretty early in the movie, but again, it's, it's kind of setting this interesting tone. And then we get towards the end where we get the friggin' train, the train, and then the helicopter. 
And that's mm-hmm. that's really the Jackie Chan stuff in this movie. And it's pretty, pretty skewed towards the end of the movie. But it is so worth it. It is ridiculous. For sure. He definitely brings it home. If he was going to kind of pin it on something, I'm glad he pinned it there in the last act. Uh, yeah. It would have felt different if perhaps a movie had set itself up to be one thing and then spent the second two thirds of that movie being something completely else. Not that we're going to talk about that today on the podcast at all. Uh, but <laughs> um, I do like that this movie kind of brings it back home. Um, and there are a lot of fun parts, but it does. It just it feels very different. Uh, it feels more like international action star than a police story type one. Like yeah. part, of the, part of the fun of that is how kind of localized the story was to this just this one Hong Kong policeman. But, you know, it is it is what it is. And it's still not bad. Like, I'll take another super cop movie, another oh, police yeah. story movie of this caliber than um, something that really just pooped the bed. Um, and I do, so, do want to talk about the 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 action scene at the end where they're on top of a train as it's moving. Oh, that was wild. Driving motorcycles on top of the train. Yeah, um, they really were just like, let's throw. They really went a uh, full um, uh, Fast and Furious on that one. They really, really were just like, oh, and then let's they throw go, as much stuff as we can at this. And then they go Mission Impossible when Jackie Chan jumps on the ladder of the helicopter that's literally flying thousands of feet above the city. And he's in that shot. Like, it's a wide shot of this helicopter. And I'm thinking, you know, Tom Cruise has not even done something this nuts uh, for an action scene. And... Oh my gosh, like you you, just watching him and his face is there because he doesn't use a stunt double. And then he shows you in the bloopers or in the outros in the credits that he is hanging on to this helicopter and all his people are terrified, but he's going to do it. Gosh, dang it. Freaking Jackie Chan. I don't know what kind of luck that guy has, but it must be wild. Like, man, I mean, I know a lot of it's skill, but to put yourself in so many death defying stunts for so many movies is just... It's, it's yeah. a special level of, of uh, intensity that I'm not sure I could ever match. I'm, not, I, I'm pretty sure most people could never match it. Ninety nine point nine percent of the population of Earth could not match that. Yeah. I mean, if you I mean, maybe you just got to look towards um, the uh, the entertainment schools, the the schools of of the arts where six year olds are being trained in both fighting and entertainment. And that's where the so next Jackie Chan will come from. What what I've heard is that the the school the school he went to was a special kind of intense, a kind of intense that's basically not allowed to exist anymore because it borders on child abuse. I want to I um, want a movie about that school. Like that sounds like an interesting biopic. <laughs> you want a movie about child abuse? Well, I want a movie about a, a very strict school and then it gets shut down. But also, it gave us Jackie Chan. So there you go. There you go. Um, now, I'm, and I'm sure if you asked Jackie Chan, he would never call it child abuse. Like that was his master and basically his family for a lot of years. Uh, but, you know, it's definitely I'm willing to bet the practices there are not really child friendly. So yeah. for every Jackie Chan, there's probably a lot of other very sadder results to those stories. Mm-hmm. Of course, he worked a long time with his uh, with his buddies, Sama Hung and Yuan Bao, who also went there. Um, that's true so they also did a lot of good I, I don't know if you've ever seen Meals on Wheels it's one of my favorite like w- uh, movies from that team of three the three dragons it's just it's so fun and it takes place in Spain it's really random huh. uh, and it has like this hard boiled detective storyline where they have to pretend they have to fill in for a private eye who's on the run because he's got a he's someone wants to collect debts from him um, but so they fill in for this guy and they still have to solve this uh, this mystery involving um, like a vanished woman and another femme fatale. There's a lot of police story elements in it, actually. Okay. Um, but it's in Spain. And they also they do run a uh, high tech food truck that has a lot of equipment that can apparently uh, double as spy equipment and also make food. Um, so it's it's <laughs> it it's sounds wild. very Pink Panther. All right. <laughs> Let's talk about the foreigner from 2017. Oh boy, let's talk about The Foreigner from 2017. Jason, take it away. The Foreigner from 2017. Nuc Minh Quan is a former Vietnam War Special Ops soldier who has lived peacefully in London for a long time. That is, until a bomb goes off and kills his daughter. 
a group calling themselves the Authentic IRA, claims responsibility for the attack, and Nok Min Kwan begins hunting them down for his revenge. It's put upon Irish politician and former provisional IRA leader, Liam Hennessy, to track down those responsible, and though he claims innocence, his hands might not be as clean as he says. Alex, some days you just can't get rid of a laptop. You really can't. You really can't. Um, so the, the premise of this movie is a little weird, uh, but this I will movie, say uh, that it was, uh, it was so much to sold, talk about. It was sold to us through uh, the, the advertisement for it that Netflix had was about it showed a lot of Jackie Chan and a little Pierce Brosnan. <laughs> and it very much made it look like it was just going to be a lot of Jackie Chan's doing like Jason Bourne taking Liam Nielsen revenge stuff. Um, Liam Neeson. Doing cool Liam Neeson stuff. Uh, doing really cool uh, like spy stuff on top of revenge stuff and it was going to be gritty and it was going to be like the side of Jackie Chan you hadn't seen before but he's still going to be doing a bunch of cool stuff and, and you know what, what did we, we did? get we, we, we got, got not that <laughs> we got I want the names yeah that's it Jackie Chan I want the, the names. lines they give Jackie Chan are just like almost downright offensive it was They're like the, the writer didn't think he could speak English and uh, I'm like um, excuse me it's Jackie Chan we're talking about here have you heard his dubs they're amazing yeah. Um, so okay. So let's talk about what this movie is. Uh, this movie starts off um, with a bombing of a a bank or a shop or something. Jackie Chan's daughter dies. They're immigrants to London, and so Jackie Chan gets all upset and he starts bugging all the government people. And we see a lot of the government people talking and trying to figure out what's going on. So we've got like government. Uh, you know, kind of turns. All, yeah, that it, part. That part feels very Jason Bourne, where you, you see yeah. just a bunch of agencies talking to each other. But and in this Jackie case, Chan, you kind of don't know how they're really connected. And you're and you're thinking, how are they going to be connected to Jackie Chan? And the the answer is they're not. The answer is Jackie Chan is like a minor blip in all of their plans, uh, and he just is there bugging them. And then all of a sudden, he goes from some guy who has a restaurant in London to super spy who knows how to make chemical bombs and rewire cars and like they give you a backstory on it but it feels no. a little forced and weird they don't give, uh, yeah they tell you that he was a fighter in uh, you can probably correct me on which war it he was, was it was um, he was a special ops officer in the vietnam war you okay so they, did they say special ops because one of those that's, elements that's was what really it is fuzzy that's what that's what it is in the book um, so that's the uh, okay. actual story. They do a lot of, uh, they're, they're really trying to do a lot of show, not tell. And they're like, eh, the audience will pick up on it, which you, I really love to see people exposition. trying to do that. I, I love seeing people try to do that because when it yeah. works, it's great. And it's way better than over explaining, but, but still, like, okay. this one kind of just doesn't hit the mark. I think. In the first five minutes of Taken, you see Liam Neeson like at his job protecting some mayor or something at a speech, and then he goes to his daughter's birthday, uh, and then his daughter goes on her trip and she gets taken. Okay, it takes a little bit longer than it does in The Foreigner, but we know who Liam Neeson is. We know he's a special service operative. It takes us so, like, I think literally halfway through the movie before we actually see the backstory of Jackie Chan's character. Um, and so... All of a sudden, he's like making bombs out of alcohol bottles and matches uh, in the in the bathroom of the government. Oh, OK, so this is the other thing. He goes to Pierce Brosnan's character. So we're starting to get this whole political intrigue between the uh, the IRA, uh, North Island and England and all this stuff going on. Um, and Jackie Chan goes and he's like, I want the names of the people who did this. The people who did this said that they were IRA. You used to be IRA, so you know who they are, and I want their names. The dude absolutely does not know their names at all. And Jackie Chan's like, I'll just bomb your bathroom and maybe you'll remember the names. But he doesn't know yeah, the it's names. Not really well, it's not really well written. He doesn't know the names. Jackie Chan follows him for days and bombs his house, his car. Uh, and all these things, and the guy does not know what he's talking about. Like, it ends, end, ends up being that he's, like, connected, but he literally doesn't have the information that Jackie Chan is bombing everything in his life for. 
like Jackie Chan just went full on. I'm going to destroy my life because he's not hiding himself. He like he has made his face seen. Um, so he's ruining his own life in order to get information that may or may not exist. Yep, pretty much. I was I was um, a little frustrated watching this movie. Also, I'm sorry, guys. He he also just like freaking vanishes for like an hour in the movie. Yeah, just just poof into nothing. Because you and know what we needed feel- instead? We needed adultery and semi incest. Yeah, no, it's really weird, and I can't tell what whether that was the plan from the get go, or if they were if Jackie Chan was like, I don't want to do all these stunts because I don't know, I'm older now. Um, it genuinely feels like a a bad attempt. Like I can almost see the book version of this. Like this is a game of telephone, right? So I can almost see the book version, the the whatever the book was called, the Chinaman. Um, yeah, being, I don't see. I don't see. I don't imagine the book being that much better. I imagine the book being a copy of Robert Ludlum's The Born Identity, which is very different from the way that the movies turned out. It is uh, like m- much grittier. Oh, and yeah. The Born Identity has, is much different. It has more elements of Born being like an older guy. So he's he has the skills, but he's also like losing them. And there's a lot of a lot more like political entry going across countries and stuff like that. And it feels like someone wrote a book kind of like that, but not as good. And then someone tried to make a movie out of it, but could it really fit all the information needed to make the movie make sense into it? And so Uh we got this movie um, where Jackie Chan is in it to have some name recognition, but really it should be. Yeah, they kind of just hired Jackie Chan to be here for like his name. And then they, the the most upsetting thing to me is that they sold the movie on his name and he's not really in it that much. Totally sold on him. Like he's on the cover. There's nothing else on the cover. There's also just this real bad habit of Western studios just not, not really understanding or utilizing or having really much respect for all that Jackie Chan is capable of and just misusing him in a lot of ways. Yeah. Like even though the fight, Really, he does like once. Even, even though a lot of uh, uh, some parts of the Rush Hour movies are a lot of fun, like a lot of them are just mismanagement of Jackie Chan. Um, and then occasionally there's like a stunt. But yeah, th- this movie kind of feels similar in a lot of ways to that, or some of the Owen Wilson escapades um, that he was part of, where uh, they didn't know what to do with him. But also now apparently they just don't want him to do stunts, or he's just too old for stunts. I don't know what the story is there. Yeah. Which is um, valid. I don't, even know, I don't even know if he's spoken on it. But, you know, the man's done over 100 movies and he's done like five bajillion death defying stunts. Yeah, he's des- he deserves to take a break, um, especially because he's he's creeping up on 70. I think he's not yeah, sev- in his 70s 67. already. Well, he was um, born in what, 54? Yeah, he's 67. There, I mean, yeah. yeah, not everyone can be Tom Cruise, like literally never stop doing stunts. Um, and that's just because Tom Cruise sacrifices babies for his youth. <laughs> yes that's true he has sold his soul or something um but yeah so i mean i i i want to say that if i if i took this out of a this is supposed to be a jackie chan movie thing in my brain that it would be a good movie but i don't think it would be i think it would still be very confusing um no even if you took the if you took jack there no one would watch it if jackie chan wasn't in it Right. I mean, yeah, sure. Apparently you can't sell on on Pierce Brosnan. Like, that's not Eh, nothing. I don't know. It's not nothing, but, like, in today's streaming culture, I mean, you really need to get some hype in order to really watch this movie. And I I think the only reason that I watched this movie was because we had it on the podcast. That's true. Even if I was going to go watch a bunch of Jackie Chan movies, this would probably be one of the last ones I got to, and I probably wouldn't be that thrilled about it. Um, Yeah. And it's... It's uh, it's kind of a bummer, but it also I think it's important to consider a movie like this in the history of Jackie Chan, not because it's like, oh, he's old now. Well, yeah, sure. Everyone gets old. That's fine. And he's going to shift his focus to other stuff. Um, but one, we should note that Jackie Chan, it does have acting chops. He is a good dramatic actor. And even though the lines he were he was given were absolute shit, um, he did. He did some he did some pretty good work with them. Um uh, the other thing we need to consider is the fact that he there's this uh, kind of like arc to his career where he's constantly trying to break into the North American market in addition to maintaining his success in the Eastern market. Yeah. Um, and when it does happen, typically, even though he does experience success over here and lots of people love Jackie Chan, 
uh, in North America, in Europe, um, in all parts of the world. Uh, basically, no one no, truly knows what to do with Jackie Chan besides Jackie Chan. I mean, we kind of saw it in the yeah. top three, too, right? Like, the best person who can manage Jackie Chan is Jackie Chan. And it's kind of sad that the only he hasn't directed more than, I think, about 10 movies over the course of his career. Um, like, it feels like I, I would like to see more Jackie Chan directed movies. Now, I don't think that's really where his focus is personally. Um, and I, I totally get that. But I would love to see more of that from him or to have seen more of that from him. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like I feel like the only one I can think of, I haven't seen every Jackie Chan movie or all of his Western ones, but like at least in Kung Fu Panda, it's not like Jackie Chan's movie. It's like Jackie Chan was in it and it makes sense because he is from that world that this movie is kind of paying homage to or parodying. Um and so he's like, he's there, he's in the background, that's cool. He does a great job with his voice. Uh, but if you're going to market your movie on Jackie Chan, like, you've got to give us Jackie Chan. Yeah, yeah. If you're going to give us a Jackie Chan movie, give us a Jackie Chan movie, you know? Yeah. I, um, we're kind of already in overall notes, like we don't yeah, really are I don't have anything else to say about The Foreigner. So let's so. slide on over to overall notes. Woo! All right, so... I think one of the things that we can learn from Jackie Chan as a whole is that just being like excellent at something, it can be cool to watch, but just being excellent at something is a, yeah, be excellent to each other. Um, But just skill on its own uh, is a good YouTube video or a good Olympics, but Mm -hmm. it's not a good movie. What makes things interesting is the, uh, the, the, the screw ups that people have the stumbles and the recovery and Jackie Chan just kind of understands that. And a lot of it leads to a more comedic kind of, uh, of performance. And I think a lot of that is just shaped by who he is as a person, but definitely the idea of like these stumbling, uh, characters who struggle and get themselves into trouble, uh, more often than they get themselves out of trouble is key to what makes his movies work. Um, yeah. And I feel There's like Jackie Chan is the one best equipped to understand that kind of character he plays like in police story. That is just really uh, just a joy to watch. And somehow, despite all of his obnoxiousness, not annoying. Yeah, no, it's true. Um, There's actually a great quote that I think was from Edgar Wright in some of the Criterion extras in his interview. He's talking about how um, Jackie Chan was trying to break out of the the Bruce Lee role mold that he was being crammed into earlier in his career. Um, and Edgar Wright says, like, when I think about Bruce Lee, I think about his signature, like, come on, like, hand move, like, basically the same one that Morpheus uses in The Matrix. is like, come on, bring it at me, is a confidence there. And he's like, when I think about Jackie Chan, though, I see a defensive posture. He's blocking. He's always blocking someone else's moves and he gets like one hit in and then he's got to block three other guys. Um, And I think that that is one of the things that is um, that lends a lot of intrigue to Jackie Chan's action and his persona is that he's he's not the top dog. I mean, he's the he's the underdog all the time. He's always um, and this is something that is really well explained in Tony Zhao's. Um, every frame of painting episode that will include a link to this is a super good job breaking down Jackie Chan, but it's, he's always at a disadvantage. He doesn't have a gun or he, you know, is his hands are tied or something is, is happening that puts him at the bottom of the fight and he has to fight tooth and nail to get his way back to the top. Um, and the fact that he is so dang talented means that we just get to sit back and watch him do that, no matter what the disadvantage was going into it. Man, I want more Jackie Chan movies. <laughs> I mean, there's there's hun- there's like already hundred of them out there. I can just go watch them. I know. If, if more there Jackie was Chan any movies. star who we could say, like, I think we have captured the essence of Jackie Chan is Jackie Chan. Yeah, he's just. He's just such a good entertainer. Every I never feel bored watching a Jackie Chan movie, which for my ADHD at least when he's on the screen. Head, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, for my ADHD riddled brain, that's really impressive. 
So good, yeah. good job, Jackie Chan. Yeah. Um, and again, those movies cover such a wide range, like from his early Kung Fu films that are more period based to, uh, you know, the police stories in the eighties, like action, that's modern action. Um, even to the modern drama, like the foreigner or some of the other like modern random things that they tried to do with Jackie Chan. Like, uh, we were talking off air about, um, the spy next door, which was like a pacifier ripoff because all of a sudden all the action, all the action stars had to have a taken and they had to have a pacifier for some reason. Uh, cause I think, Vin Diesel had the first pacifier and then there was like Dwayne Johnson gets did a basically a pacifier. Now. That's a great sentence out of context. Yes. Everyone gets a pacifier. Um, but yeah, so I mean, Jackie Chan and then again, his voice acting uh, with stuff like um, Kung Fu Panda, even his Jet Li crossover with the, I think it was the Magic Kingdom, Forbidden Kingdom, something kingdom. Um like he's just done so much stuff that again we have like Jackie Chan has tried his hand at so many different things that we really have a pretty good picture through his canon now, which, like you said, is not over, but I assume is kind of coming towards its, um, towards its end here in the next few years, unfortunately. But we have so much Jackie Chan that we can look back on and and keep enjoying. Yeah, go watch more Jackie Chan movies. There's just there's, there's so many. There's so many. Yeah, so many movies. Um, so many and yeah, there's there's definitely there is an argument to be made that Jackie Chan is one of the best actors ever um, because he's a, capable of so much beyond just making a face at a camera. Uh, it's a not different to undercut kind of thing that part of acting. Than but he, like, it definitely, I feel like you could make the argument easier that he's one of the best physical actors ever. Yeah, and it's it's almost like in the golden age when you everyone was was falling over triple threats who could sing and dance and act um, whenever sound started to come around. But like Jackie Chan, like his fighting is almost dancing. Like he is falling into kind of a long line of of entertainers that just like physically are so capable and and it's just it's amazing. It's not the same as dancing, but it's he brings a whole like new element to acting and entertaining that is granted an even smaller niche than than dancers and singers in Hollywood. Oh, for sure. For sure. With uh, this kind of acrobatics and stunt capability, that is really rare. Yep. All right, Jonathan. Uh, what are we going to be talking about next time on the podcast? Yeah, next time we're going to talk about a directing duo, which we may have done once or twice. I, I can't remember if we've done a duo before. Uh, but we're going to be talking about the directing slash producing slash writing duo of Chris Lord and Phil Miller. Or did I get those backwards? Phil Lord and Chris Miller? Yeah, it could be Lord either. and Miller. <laughs> I've heard it both ways. Lord and Miller. Uh, and so the films we're going to be covering are their classic 2009 film, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, 21 Jump Street, their remake from 2012, the Lego movie from 2014 and a film that they co-wrote but did not direct uh, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse from 2018. Which is a really good movie, but hard to fit into a lot of categories. So, yeah, it's nice to get it on to a episode. 21 Jump Street is definitely kind of the odd man out in this list. But we're going to see this is most I think these are all the four feature films that they have directed uh those are the three feature films they've directed. They've done a lot of producing. They're very influential in animation right now, obviously also in some other spheres. They almost did solo. They've done some animated uh, t TV shows. Uh, so they've, they've got a lot going on for them right now. So we're going to look into why they're so popular. Um, but if you would like to support us on the show, we have a Patreon account and you can go over there and get access to the, discord channel where sometimes i will be watching a movie and all of a sudden i will feel like i just need to basically live tweet the film but instead of live you watch tweeting, it get really mad at the foreigner <laughs> i get really mad at the foreigner instead of live tweeting we do it through the discord for the patrons um and we also have a bonus podcast and the last time on the bonus podcast we talked about in the heights which premiered in theaters and on hbo max recently um and is a film adaptation of Lin Manuel. Lin-Manuel Miranda's 
uh, I think his first stage musical. Um, so if you would like to hear us talk about that, you can head over there. Exactly. Uh, but that's about all the time we have for this episode. If you have movie suggestions for us or just want to reach out, I can be found on Twitter at at JS Satchel. And I'm at Alice Geringer. And I'm at the Blue Jay 1994. And to find links to things that we talked about today, you can view them on the blog at thefilmlinks.com. If you like the show, let us know. Leave us a review on iTunes so other people will know what we're all about. We definitely appreciate it. Talk to you next time. All right, see ya. Oh, and and uh, there's a long sequence at the beginning where um, uh, Jackie Chan works as a waiter for the food truck, and he skates. He uses a skateboard and then skates around this square and gets people's orders and delivers them food. Um, so if you want to see Jackie Chan skateboard, check out Meals on Wheels. That's awesome. Look out, Tony Hawk. All right, shall we move on to our last? I want, I want Jackie Chan pro skating. I want that game. <laughs> I'm sure that you, we could come up with some some very interesting Jackie Chan movies. I just want I just or games. I want a game of Jackie Chan's stunt studio. Did you watch the Criterion extras of his stunt? I've team seen a his... lot of I've seen a lot of them workshopping. I didn't watch any uh, Criterion extras of it this week, okay. but I've seen a lot of that content and it is really cool. Yeah, it's, it's wild. It's awesome. Um, and if you watch it on Criterion, you get the the classic old guy PBS voiceover who just spells everything out for you in the blandest way possible. So that's fun. Oh, nice.